Let me send greetings as well from the Northwest. I was in the Northwest um, yesterday. Uh, they send their greetings uh, mm. from the place we call it Small Josie, uh, Jobedina. Uh, but uh, we welcome everyone this morning and thank you for taking time um, to come to church this morning in the midst of rain. Uh, some did not make it outside the bed. It is warm inside. And some due to circumstances could not come, but we pray that the Lord will grant them grace um, wherever they are. Um, today we're going to be looking at Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5 to 9. Um, if you have a copy of God's Word, may you please turn there. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 9. Um, the title of our message today is The Impact of the Gospel in the Workplace. The Impact of the Gospel in the Workplace. If you want to be more radical and be original... Slaves and masters enslaved. Let's not run away from the word. Uh, because both of those two, as we look at today, we're going to see a picture of, um, of slaves. I don't want us to run away from the concept because most of our Bible translations run away from this concept. Some versions will call them bond servants and servants. Uh, but I want to be radical. But for Jeff, for the purpose of the message so that it doesn't scare people away. It is the impact of the gospel in the workplace. And then for Ronaba Galimfa, slaves, welcome to church. Uh, your master, which has spoken here, will speak to us today. Um, we have been in the book of Ephesians. For those that have been here, um, we've been working through Ephesians verse by verse. Um, to this point, we have come today to Ephesians chapter 6, uh, verse 5 to 9. Um, I want to read this passage and just set it before you as a settings, and then we'll dig into our scriptures today. And I want to approach in a Bible study format uh, where we're going to look at these things that we're really afraid to address. Um, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5 um, to 9, it reads as such. May I please ask those that are able to stand, uh, just to stand briefly for the reading of the word of God as a sign of reverence and respect. By Ephesus chapter 6, verse 5. Slaves, obey your human masters with fear and trembling, in the sincerity of your heart, as to Christ. Don't work only while being washed, in order to please men, but as slaves of Christ, do God's will from your heart. Serve with a good attitude, as to the Lord, and not to men, knowing that whatever good each one does, Slave or free, you will receive this back from the Lord. And, the, and masters, treat your slaves the same way without threatening them, because you know that both their masters and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. Let me just breathe a prayer for us. Uh, Lord, we come before you this morning, Lord, thanking you for this rain, thanking you for cleaning the air, Lord. We pray, Father, that... As we come here in corporate worship, Lord, to hear your word, Father, may you please bless the speaker and the hearer, Lord. May there be two people in this pulpit, Lord. May I only be a vessel of your word in clarity and in explaining it. We ask this in your wonderful name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Um, I just ask you for an announcement that uh, there won't be any children's church today. Um, the children will be sitting with their parents. Um, uh, for those that don't have parents, they will ask one of the elderly just to keep looking at the little kids. They're sitting at the back, um, just to see if they're still well. And we shake him up a little bit until um, we go home. But now let's go back to our passage for today. The concept of slaves and masters. Uh, amongst us, the preachers, we are arguing, who takes this? Who takes this? Uh, Basil is lucky he's sick <laughs> because it's a difficult topic that uh, people don't like to talk about. Uh, every time we think of slaves and masters, uh, we think about it in our immediate context. Uh, not so far along from colonialism, le apartheid, right? Uh, no one wants to hear slave. Uh, no one wants to address people as master. And funny enough, when you watch Chinese movies, uh, those that watch those Once Upon a Time in China, 
I'm, I'm one of those fans. Uh, you can see those guys bowing down. Master, I want to become like you. And this is the idea that I want to bring to you because if the concept is understood clearly and articulated very well, we won't shy away from the concept of slaves and masters. And my goal today is also to show you that you are also a slave being here. You are a slave of Christ. Not long before you were a slave of sin, but because of the gospel, you have been redeemed from that slavery into a master that makes you co-heirs into his kingdom. But I want to go through with you through history briefly so that uh, to address some of the concepts that you might have of slavery so that I don't jump over these things because when we think of slavery, we're thinking not so long ago, 1652, right? Uh, when the Dutch landed at the, in Cape Town. Those that have done history. By science, reach Hokelenka Newton's law, you will address it after church. Uh, for what gravity, what king, king gravity that pulls things down? Uh, this morning, we want to pull things up. Uh, so bear with me this morning. But history, our problems in, in our context started in 1652, and most of the time when we think about slavery, uh, the concept of apartheid comes into mind, right, Mufundis? Uh, the segregation that you see in the country where you are located, it is because of a system uh, that was man-made, not God-made, man-made, uh, for segregating God's people. Uh, but even in today's, um, slavery does still exist in the concept it used to exist um, in the olden day. Um, the term slavery indicates a wide range of human rights. Um, that's why you will hear unions talking about slave wages, right? Uh, because they're trying to move away from the idea of people being oppressed. And then the United Nations defines the contemporary slavery as a variety of human rights violation. In addition to, to traditional slavery, the slave trade, these abuse include the sale of children, child prostitution, child pornography, exploitation, child labor, and the term slavery recently by the Anti-Slavery Society report that millions of children are being forced into slavery. Some working in the mines in the early age, some working as maids um, in people's households, and some also in culturally being sold off uh, to a rich man um, to go bear them children to become their slaves. And this is the idea that people have in their mind when we talk about slavery. And that's not what I want you to have in mind today. Let's go back to our text. Because if slavery is understood correctly, we will embrace it. We will stand firm. We will stand on the top of a mountain and blast it and herald it. But let's go back to our test this morning, Ephesians chapter 5. What I want to do this morning, I want to bring the context of our passage. What I want to show you, let's first start, who Paul is addressing. Because it is very important. Most of the time we take these topics and assume it's being addressed to the world. And then we take what the world does and import it into the church. Quickly turn back to Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, I said we're going to approach it like a Bible study. If you do have a pencil, there's some things that I want you to highlight and circle in your Bible. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1. Let's look at the people that are being addressed. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will, to the faithful saints in Jesus Christ at Ephesus. Paul is addressing who? The church in Ephesus. Simply meaning in the congregation that days where people, slavery and masters was normal. Sitting right next to each other, I think Basil tried to address that, was the family, was the children, and the slaves of that family. So what Paul is trying to do, uh, because he's taking this concept and trying to bring it home, in the context of slavery, Paul starts saying in Ephesians chapter 5, Verse 13, that you are the light in the world. Previously you were in darkness, now you are in light. So side by side in church, there's masters, there's slaves. Let me bring it to our context. 
side by side in church we have employees employers we have ceos we have cleaners we have engineers and already but it's among my lungs man there are people in categories in the church and paul is saying simply in addressing this issue because what he's trying to address is that ephesians chapter 5 verse 18 do not be like those who get drunk, but be spirit-filled. And the idea that when you are spirit-filled, it changes your life. The moment you are born again, you've understood the gospel, you view the lens through what the Bible says you should see. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, which is our umbrella um, for the text we are looking at, it says, submitting to one another in fear of Christ. If it would have been possible, we would have looked in from Ephesians 5.22 right to Ephesians chapter 6 because it's all one context. When people become born again, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22, wives, submit to your own husbands, meaning that there is a ranking. Funny enough, when you look at uh, Bible translation, if you have the NSB, I think you're the only one that has the NSB in Fundis, some words that are not in the original are put in italic. So that when you read the sentence, it would read, wives to your own husband. Because they would have understood verse 21, submitting to one another is an idea of the military. Everyone, my band are not on top of the general general you get what i'm saying everyone has a purpose and it's not a matter of it's a matter of order wives submit to your own husbands if you turn to first corinthians chapter 11 verse 3 it will tell you i want you to know that christ is the head of every man and the man is the head of the woman and god is the head of Christ, meaning that there is an order. That's why we take very seriously eldership in the church and fathers being present, taking lead in their homes and also availing themselves, being an example as well. Not only that, husbands love your wife. These two concepts of the marriage Sometimes I was speaking to, to, to Jeff the other week to say, submission and loving when everything is going well is fine. It is seen when there is tension in the marriage. Because the world will tell you, Mont. The Bible will say, Ikoko The world will say, The Bible will say, Love your wife. But it doesn't stop there. Children, Obey your parents. Children, honor your fathers because it is the right thing to do so that it may be well with you. Some of you in the Christian life, we need to look at how you conduct yourself in the family home. Your parents are your parents, whether born again or not born again. The instruction is obey. And then now we come to slaves and masters. I am stressing this point because I want you to get the context that once you are born again, you view life differently. I want to stress it again because it is very possible to come to any portion of scripture and miss the fact that the Bible is ultimately and simply to introduce us to Jesus Christ. That is the primary responsibility when we stand here proclaiming the good news. That the one who has done what I cannot do, what you cannot do to reconcile you to God, has done it for you and for me. Quickly, back to Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13. There's one thing I want you to see so that you can see before we move forward what the gospel has done. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13 says, When you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed in him, you were also sealed 
with the promised Holy Spirit. Meaning, Christ has sealed this truth in us. But not everyone who has been here week in, week out has understood this truth, right? There's some that have understood, there's some that have not understood. The matter whether this truth has settled in your heart has not been there. Do I believe it? Do I not believe it? Is it true? But I'm glad you are here because God is at work in you and he will accomplish what he's desired to do in your world. But to those who've under, who have been paying attention, submitting means ranking, right? Wives, rank yourselves under. Children, rank yourselves under. Now, slaves, rank yourselves under. That's about Balona, the Sokolov and Credit Promotion. Because we want to be the master when we are the slave at work. When the boss says, do this, uh -uh, I know better. Uh -uh, I think it should be done this way. And that's what gets us in trouble. Because sometimes we are trying to be creative when we've been given clear instructions. I hope that shakes you up. When you leave here, there is a difference between obey and submit. As a child of God, the word of God calls for your obedience. Don't do your best. Guys, don't do your best, Kausan. I hope you've prepared. I hope you listened. Because those things have a promise. But Paul is addressing those relationships. Let's start with verse chapter 5. For those that are taking notes, um, I've drawn an outline for us um, so that it's easy to follow. Our outline is the instructions given, which we see in verse 5 and 6. Ditaelo. Uh, Ditaelo is a very bad word because our friends and our families, simply meaning they are going to execute instructions. And then the second point will be the implementation, uh, which is what we do, and then the incentive, meaning the things that we get when we obey, and the ideal. But we start with the first one, the instruction. Let's start with the first one, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5. Slaves, obey your human masters. I want to address this concept first of obey. Obey simply means follow commands. Follow instructions. The difference between obey and submission. Submissions means you yield your authority to someone. As a child of God, you yield your authority to who? To the Lord. Not to me. Not to Mfundisi. To the Lord. Mfundisi is our... One, we, when we are confused, we look at him as we mimic what he does. Hoping that he does... What the word of God says. And this idea of slaves, most versions try to say bond servant. And it is, it is very easy for me uh, to go employer, employee, but I think you're very smart because some of you want to get an understanding. What does the Bible say in terms of slavery? Does it condone it? Does it condemn it? Or what does it say? But most versions will see that the King James calls it servant. The Message Bible calls it servant. The New King James calls it servant. But there's those few translations that have kept the idea of slaves. Because there's a principle that you need to take from there. And Paul did not run away from this idea of being slave. Quickly turn to Romans chapter 1 verse 1. Because I want you to see it in your Bible so that these terms we don't run away. Baroma chapter 1, Khaula Gyantla. Paul says, Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus. Do you see that in your own Bible? It doesn't say Paul. Some version will say, Paul, a bond servant of Christ Jesus. But in the original, is written slave. Because in the old context, what the church in Ephesus had, uh, we usually watch these movies where there's runaway slaves, right? 
uh, and 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 usually when those slaves run away because they look like us, we are very happy uh, because there is a master, and and when he catches him, what happens? It's punishment. Not only is punishment, sometimes sometimes there's punishment to a point of death. Through whipping, sometimes being sold off to a new slave. But let's look at what Paul says when one of the slaves runs away. Turn with me to Philemon, because I want to show you what the Bible says. As you turn into Philemon, even Paul in Titus chapter 1 will say, Paul, a slave of God, an apostle of Christ Jesus. The parallel verse will tell you, slaves, obey your human masters. But turn to Philemon chapter 8. We're going to read from 8 to 21. I would have read from the top, but for the purpose of our time, um, I'm going to read from verse 8. But my key point that I want to you see that I want you to see is in verse 16. Verse 8 reads as such: For this reason, although I have great boldness in Christ to command you to do what is right, I appeal to you instead on the basis of love. I, Paul, as an elderly man, and now as a prisoner of Christ Jesus, appeal to you for my for my son Onesimus. I fathered him while I was in chains. Once he was useless to you. But now he is useful, both to you and to me. I am sending him back to you as part of myself. I want you to keep him with me, so that in my imprisonment for the gospel, he might serve me in your place. But I didn't want to do anything without your consent, so that, you, so that your good deed might not be out of obligation, but of your own free will. For perhaps this is why he was separated from you for a brief time, so that you might get back permanently, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, as a dearly loved brother. He is special, so to me, but even more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. What I want to draw your attention is that this slave ran away, and the idea is that when you get the gospel, sometimes you want to separate from where God has us, break free. But Paul is sending him back to his owner. And he's pleading with the owner. He's not just a slave to you. He is a dearly loved brother. Meaning, in the church, between masters and slaves, they saw each other as brothers and sisters in the Lord. They did not see each other as a slave, as a master, when they came in congregation. They sat under the word of God, under the instruction of the word of God, serving one master in different levels. And that's how you should be as well, as a slave of Christ. Notice what goes on in these verses. The Bible does not run away from this concept of slavery. Our Lord himself used this example of slave and master, saying you cannot have two masters. You will either love one or hate the other. Ultimately, the context of what they heard, Paul was saying, as you receive the word of God, the gospel of your salvation, don't do things that the world will say, Be disobedient to your masters. In the employment world, be disobedient to your employer. Month end, they will show you who's boss. Am I lying? And that is the concept. The concept of slavery was that if you serve a master that looks after you well, there is food you are taken care of in that context of the church in Ephesus. But 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 22 says, For he who is called by the Lord as a slave is the Lord's freeman. Likewise, he who is called a freeman is Christ's slave. You were bought at a price. You 
there is ownership when it comes to slavery. Not only are you slaves to your employer, highly you are more slaves to Christ because of what Christ has done for you and for me at the cross. Purchasing us with his blood. And then they give a parallel in the Bible and a slave is praised when he does good work for his master. And the concept of slaves in conclusion, when you present the gospel, we do not want to tell people to come to Christ. There is freedom in Christ. Because when you come to Christ, when you are born again, independence, freedom, submission of your will is to Christ. The other day we looked at when the Spirit of God is in you, you can pray for whatever you want. Because the desires that is in you are of the Spirit. You are owned by the Lord. Therefore, we submit to the Lord. But the Lord says, as you submit to the Lord, submit to your human masters. Look in your Bible there, Ephesians chapter 5. There's some words that I want you to highlight. Slaves, obey your masters with fear and trembling in the sincerity of your heart as to Christ. There's a standard. The standard is not your neighbor. The same way you submit to Christ, you submit to your human masters. And notice what it says. Don't do this out of compulsion. Do it with fear and trembling as if you are doing it for the Lord. And that should be the separation of God's children and those that are not of God's children in the workplace. Your managers should know the difference. If I choose that one, it's not going to go well for me. But if I choose that employee, there is a difference. It's because the efforts that you put into your work, it's as if you were doing it for the Lord. And that's what we're called to do. We do not work when we've been looked at. You, as a child of God, you should be able to work independently because it says, do it with fear and trembling in the sincerity of your heart. It is a heart issue. Mm -hmm. When you are an ambassador of Christ, Wherever you are, you are an extension of God's kingdom. In the workplace where you work. Not just the church. You see that at church, the devil gives us an off. No, go to church. I'll see you Monday. The problem comes in Monday. When our employers look at us like, hey, Bazalwan. And they don't see the difference. At some point, Bazalwani are even... Thank you for that echo. It's as if you read my mind, I was afraid to say it. But this is what God calls us to be. Everything that you do as an instruction, do it as if you are doing it for the Lord. Sometimes the situations are not nice, right? Sometimes you're working under conditions that are not nice. Paul is not taking that away from the slaves of those days in extension to us, those that are in employment. There are those days that you don't want to work or wake up tomorrow morning. Funny enough, Mfunisa, I'm sorry you're making excuses. Uh, this thing baffles me because Lim I was telling her, no, it's raining. Uh, I can't go. Uh, but tomorrow, what do people do in the workplace? Do they say, oh, no, it's raining. The matrix, some of them are not here, Mfundis. Tomorrow, they will not say, oh, no, it's raining. I'm staying home. What do they do? The instruction is that obey. In the same extent you obey here, should be the same extent you obey. What more for your master who has promised you eternal life? Sometimes we're chasing the material things and not prioritize our time to come give thanks to the Lord for what he has done from Monday to Saturday.
And on Sunday, I come in corporate worship. I was singing so loud, my voice is here because I don't get to sing that loud. I wanted to grab the mic from, from Jake's there to say, Jake's, give me a chance, Linda. Let me praise the Lord and do some lip service because God has done so much. But in terms of our priorities, let's look at them. The same way we look at our employment, our responsibilities on earth, let us take time to come give our master the same praise. But let's move to our next point, the implementation. Verse 7 says, serve with a good attitude. It does not stop there. As to the Lord. Even those ones that are doing housework, do it for the glory of God. When you wake up in the morning hustling to work, do it with a good attitude. Not mumbling. There are those Baba Khutzing in our old generations we would know if you didn't have a good attitude, right there you'd be disciplined by your parents. Right between the sugar and the pop. In front of your friends. And sometimes you'd walk away mumbling hoping that your parents don't hear you because you could die the second death. <laughs> but over here we are told, serve with a good attitude. And notice, all of these concepts has as to the Lord. Mm. What you submit at work, would the Lord be happy of what you put on the table? How you approach your studies, gents, will the Lord be happy? God, I hope you've been studying. I'm not fasting for your studies. God gave us 24 hours. And the thing is that the children of the world pay much attention to these things. Time set aside, they are very strict. After after when you miss church, you go sit home guilty. Learn to see those traps that the devil put for you. Giving God substandard work. And not just God, even your employer. And the gospel you are telling them every week. Guess what happens to it in Fundis? There is no value. If this is what your God demands of you to submit substandard work, I don't want your God. That's why a Muslim will be comforted because the commitment that they have for what they believe is much more higher than what they see in what you believe. That's why you serve with a good attitude. And that's why when we grew up, you remember this context. Those that do not want to work, right? It was biblical. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10. Paul said, in fact, when, you were, when we were with you, this is what we commanded you. If anyone isn't willing to work, he should not eat. Meaning, we serve, we do well, there is a reward. I gain the standard as to the Lord. I'm stressing the slave part because once we understand that concept, masters are also slaves somewhere. I'm looking at our time. Let me press on. The incentive. Verse 8. Dituelo Says, knowing that whatever good each one does, slave or free. You see the difference now? Now he starts addressing those that are free and those that are slaves, he will receive back from who? From the Lord. As children of God in every situation, we do not look to our immediate masters. Those that are at the top, this is what the Lord is saying. One thing as a child of God, know this. Don't assume, don't wish, 
Children of God live off promises of God. Know that whatever you do for your human employer, whether seen or unseen, God saw it. God will reward you. Sometimes it's not immediate. Sometimes it's a little bit further. Out of nowhere, God will open an opportunity because what you were doing, you were doing it as if you were doing it for the Lord. And as children of God, we need to grab that concept. Whatever we do in our implementation, let us know that there is a reward for us. Not only humanly, but in the next life. And the bottom line is that Christ will request accountability for the time you were given. In the immediate, the matrix, your accountability will be in December. Come, your accountability will be in the new year early. But let's look at what the Bible says in terms of accountability. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. Do not assume that with the time you have been given, in our slang language, you can say you were killing time. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 tells us, We must all appear before the tribunal of Christ, so that each may be repaid for what he has done in the body, whether good or useless. Those that gave time to their studies will see them at the end of the year. Those that did not give their time, that word worthless, I don't know what version, some version says um, at the end, good or evil. Yakakam was even more stronger. What you guys did was evil. Wasting God's time that he has allotted to you. And I keep reminding us, we only have so much time. Ask them to treat the value of one year or a first year student when the results come out. Because you see the time as if it was a loss. It was worthless, the time I've spent. Because what the results show says I was not paying attention. <coughs> but it's not the end. Do good. Because there will be an accountability that God will require from you. And for those that do well, you'll be repaid. Sometimes we're looking at the monetary value. Sometimes you do well in God's life. In extension to you, Mount Fun, you see the, the doctors had said you would not be here, but by God's grace, those things, it's God at work. As we do God's work, investing in God's kingdom, God takes care of our situations. Don't just look for things that are material. Some of you are not sick. Some of you are not working, but God provides. The grace of God. And sometimes you do not see the seed that your parents, your grandparents have sowed. And God has been faithful in the time where you want to throw in the towel. But God is saying, for those that labor in my kingdom, I have your requests. Sometimes you don't know how to put it before God. But God is a master that is faithful. He knows what you need to say, even when you don't even have the words. And that's what I want to bring to you. Know that there is a reward, not only for your human masters, but for you personally, as you invest in the Lord. There is comfort. There is healing. Sometimes parents left you. You're trying to put things together. But the work that you are doing is as if no one notices. And I want to let you know God notices. Even to the employers, employees, uh, that over time you are working, that they're not paying, but you are being faithful as God instructed you. Yes. Know that God sees. Those of you that have businesses that people are not paying, at some point God will open that door when we least expect it. It is because you have invested, you have obeyed the word of God on the human level. And when people look at you, they see the beauty of the gospel. And this is what Christ calls us. There's a reward 
It might not be in this life, but like Lazarus, when he died, the Bible says the angels, not for the rich man, for Lazarus, the angels came for him. So in your situation, I don't know where everyone is, but take comfort that God rewards those that who are faithful. Yes. Stand firm, press on. It is difficult, but the Lord is faithful, even when we want to give up. And that's what we're thankful for the gospel, because if we could lose our salvation, it's easy to give up. Waking up in the morning already with life's challenges, but be reminded that you have a master in heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding for you and for me. As the devil puts his trap, he has prepared a way of escape. He left you the comforter to comfort you in the middle of the night when those tears fall down and you don't see each other, but God sees. And our last point, the ideal. We go down to our last verse, which say, And masters, treat your slaves the same way. Now, Paul is addressing those that are in charge. The same way I've instructed the slaves to be obedient, to serve from the heart as if they're serving the Lord, to serve with sincerity, to work as if they're not being watched. It says, do not threaten them. Meaning, your first instinct should not be of discipline. You should be fair. Let it be known that this manager I want to work for. I'm from the Northwest where there are mines. And usually in the Northwest, we still feel some of the apartheid in Fundis. Uh, but my mother used to work as uh, Baba Bisa and these people that when you don't, you're a debt collector uh, to go, when you're not paying and they hand you over uh, to go confiscate. Uh, while waiting at the mines, uh, you'd hear people talking, oh, you know what, uh, that, that white man is so rough swearing at people, giving instructions. But what people could not understand is that most of the black people wanted to work for him. Because in time when the shafts were shaking, he was not the first one to go out. He looked for every man that he went in with and made sure they came out. And this is what is called for managers. We lead from the front. As you follow Christ, as you see Christ as an example, mm -hmm. you become the same example to those that follow you. Not only did God put you in that senior position for your comfort, it is so that you can be an example so that it's known that there are human masters that deal with, per with people fairly, not choosing sides, but applying the right thing, doing things from the heart, having compassion, as Christ has compassion for you, being forgiven. And I think this is the most difficult one. And I think, ladies, this is where they struggle. Oh, but no, I'm going to go to 1963, one, two, three. Some are naturally so happy, some are not. Not wanting to forgive. Forgive those that are your subordinates. Be sincere. Do things from the heart for them. A child is sick, be compassionate. They are not well. And I think for me, that's the beauty. Um, I work for a manager that has compassion. When the little one is sick, I can call her. When the little one was, uh, had a tragedy, they said, Chief, don't take leave. Uh, take your laptop, work from the hospital. And it makes it a pleasure because they know the difference when they see a child of God that has been putting work faithfully as if for the Lord. There are some benefits that you reap. Not now. Some are immediate, some are later. But the ideal is that masters, humanly, and in the context of today, that is employers, serve them well. Serve them with a good heart. Serve people diligently. 
First Peter chapter 1, verse 18, 19 says, For you know that you have been redeemed from your empty way of life, inherited from the fathers, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of the Lamb, without defect and blemish. When it says, and masters, treat your slaves in the same way without threatening them, because you know that both their masters and yours is in heaven. This is what Paul is saying. We've been bought by the precious blood of Christ. Both masters and slaves. In closing, let me summarize it this way. Our first point of the instruction to bring it home. Employees, obey your employers as you would the Lord with fear and trembling. Follow the instructions you are given in the workplace. Matrix, follow your teacher's instructions when they said you need to obey them. And most of all, guys, obey those that are in authority. Because all authority comes from God. Government, masters, parents, teacher, uncle, auntie. Who did I forget in the sequence? Oh, that one bothers me. We'll talk about it afterwards. I don't want to include it here. There are some sins that don't lead to death. <laughs> Yeah, God is gracious in that avenue. Sometimes the foot goes harder than it's supposed to go, uh, but God is gracious. I repent afterwards. You'll see me return it. But for you, authority, follow instructions, follow commands. Do it diligently as you would the Lord. For implementation, employees, serve with a good attitude. Colossians 3 verse 23 says, whatever you do, do it... Oh. My version will say enthusiastically, with joy, with pride. Sometimes I, I struggle working with people at work because people give low quality infundis. I would send it back. Uh, in my auditing field, I would take juniors um, outside there. Some of them would want to explore, and I would look at shady work. Guys, do you want to work or you want to go see the beach? I uh, want to go see the beach. Go. I would do the work myself. One ingredient for teaching someone, there must be an ingredient of interest. It's pointless to give someone something that they do not want. We are being mentored here by Muruti, me and Kabu because we have an interest for this. We do our part, he corrects us. Sometimes uh, we leave with arguments, not helping Fundis with what you have to say. But we take it that we are being shepherded. God has placed us under a shepherd to mentor us, to shape us. And some of you, God has placed you under certain authorities. Do it diligently, with a good heart, with joy and with pride, as if you are doing it for the Lord. The third one says, employees and employers, expect your reward from God. Whenever you're doing something, do it with an expectation that God sees and God rewards and lastly, the ideal. Those in senior positions be examples of Christ in the workplace. Treat those below you with fairness, showing no favoritism. Colossians chapter 3 verse 25 says, The wrongdoer will be paid back for whatever wrong he has done. And there is no favoritism. Even if it's a child of God that mis misbehaves, the same discipline applies to him even more for Wanamudim. But in conclusion, to those who want to be Christ's slaves, serving in his kingdom and doing the work of God, turn with me to John 6, 28, 29. Let's see where this starts. John 6, verse 22. Are we there? John. The Gospel John. I'll wait for you because I want you to take this verse home with you. Are we there? John 6, 28, 29. What can we do to perform the works of God? They asked. Jesus replied, 
This is the work of God, that you believe in the one he has sent. We start there. You first believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord. That you were sent for God into this world to pay for the penalty of death for you and me, ransomed out of slavery. Notice which slavery? Sin. And when you were bought, ransomed out of that community, you joined a kingdom. And in the kingdom, like in the olden days where children used to live at the farms, the more children you had, the more work was done on the farm. Children were not in the house playing PlayStation, FIFA, speaking to the guys. They were out there laboring, doing work for their parents. What more your father in heaven who gave his son to die for me and for you. And notice, Christ calls for exclusive ownership. Yeah. He does not share you with the devil. There are only two fathers in this world. It's either you're the family of Satan or you're the family of God. By default, you are born into the family of Satan. Through Christ at the cross, you have been redeemed into the family of God. That's why Ephesians says we have been adopted. We are not born into this family. Remo is not born into it. That's why I need to shepherd that heart while she's still young. So that when she's grown, she will not depart from the word of God. Not only that, Christ calls for complete and consistent availability and obedience. Subject to one will. Christ saw this burden in front of him. He said, Father, if it's possible, may this cup move. But, not my will, but your will be done. No man can serve two masters. That's why Mark 12, 30 will say, Love the Lord your God with all your soul, all your might, all your heart, all your strength. Not partial. All means all. And thirdly, all discipline and reward comes from the Father. The word of God will chastise us back into the road. A child of God does not fall away permanently into sin. The moment you find yourself because you've got the word of God in you, you are quick to repent and ask for forgiveness. Turn to God. God, I have not been a good example in where you have placed me. And that's why Peter will later say, Mothers, because you take that there are those that have been married, but they are married to spouses that are not saved. that Through your conduct, maybe your husband will be saved. But the problem is that we do not carry ourselves in a gospel-worthy manner. Some of our spouses that we have, when they see us, they don't see the gospel that we tell them. So when we leave here, all of us in all categories of life, where God has called you, as a single person, as a married couple, as a child, as a parent, whatever you do, do it as if you are doing it for your master in heaven. That way you know that there is a permanent reward in the next life. May we bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning, Lord, thanking you, Lord, that we were born into sin, Lord, but thank God for the cross. Thank you, Lord, for thinking of us, as Ephesians says, before time began, that before my mother knew my father, you had set me aside for your gospel. We pray for everyone here, Lord, that you have chosen, that you have called out, Lord, that they've taken time to be here in corporate worship, Lord. There are times, Lord, we have not been faithful in serving the human masters you've given us. But we pray, Lord, as we come before you, approaching your throne of grace, 
knowing that you are a merciful God, to forgive us. We do pray and ask, Lord, that as we leave here, Lord, may we leave knowing that everything that we do, may we do it as if we are doing it for you, Lord. In our categories where we serve as employees in the workplace, where we serve as employers' representatives, guide us, give us wisdom, that we may proclaim the gospel without sharing it. That those looking at us might know that these are the children of God. I want these ones working for me. I want these ones working underneath me because they serve as if they're serving you. And I do pray, Lord, for those that might feel that they've been short down, Lord. I pray, Father, may they find in their hearts to forgive those that have wronged them. May they find it in their hearts for those that they feel have not served them well. And I do pray, Lord, as well for our shepherd that you've given us as we serve underneath him, Lord. May we do everything as we're doing it for you. We pray, Lord, that as we are laboring in your kingdom, whatever our hands find to do, Lord, may we do it with all the best of our ability, with good intentions, with joy in our hearts knowing that there is a Father in heaven that sees we are not working for people to see us, Lord. In the nights when people are not looking, we are laboring for your kingdom. I pray for those, Lord, that replenish, Lord, where the fuel is running dry for your kingdom. Give them strength, give them encouragement to continue and soldier on. I do pray for those that are here, Lord, without knowing you, wanting to yield to your authority as slaves of Christ. We pray, Father, that these hearts only you can touch. We speak to the ears, but only you can take it to the heart. We pray for their compassion, we pray for their hearts, and we pray, Lord, may they not die not knowing and coming to you as Lord and Savior, serving in your kingdom, being members of one body as we mature as a church in Mommy Lord. Thank you, Father, and I ask this in your wonderful name. Let us be a blessing to those that we serve. Let us be a blessing to those that we serve under. And may we not run away from this concept, Lord, because we know that you have regulated it. You do not condemn it, nor condone it, but you've given us the word of God to regulate how we should work with those relationships that we have. Thank you, Father, in the wonderful name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.